going to go and share my screen here and we'll uh, we'll kick off the introduction so there we go i've got my screen up the recording is live um so hello from everywhere around the world from uh, from azerbaijan and romania to australia and all points in between from north and south this is uh excellent we love seeing the representation here so um and of course then there's Jason, who has to put in his exact latitude and longitude. Out of boy, buddy. Um, all right. So, uh, so welcome to the uh, the current meetup for this month. Here, this is going to be a hybrid meetup that we're going to be dealing with, where we're going to be talking about a little bit about Power BI, a little bit about Excel. Um, but before we uh, we start off on this one, I just want to go through and cover off our uh, our slide deck for the stuff that we got going. So this is the November 19th uh, Vancouver Power BI Modern Excel User Group Edition, and uh, the feature presentation tonight is going to be led by this guy here. Um, so we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, about our Power Query and some merging uh, things that we got going on. But before we do that, um, we're going to kick into our little welcome, which we're into right now. Uh, the first thing is uh, around 6.05-ish after I get through these slides. I'm going to kick it over to Joseph, who's going to give us the uh, what's new in Power BI over the last little while. Uh, that's going to run to about 6.20. I'm going to say 6.20-ish, depending on uh, on how much um, uh, Joseph still has to uh, to kick in. And then after that, I'll uh, I'll take over for the next hour-ish because I actually haven't timed my presentation. I don't know exactly how long it's going to take me, so uh, we'll run until we're done. And uh, the big thing, of course, is that we will record this. We'll post it on YouTube uh, when we're done. So if you have to drop off because you, you're in Romania or Azerbaijan and falling asleep, all good. I will make sure that you know when the recording is up online as well. I want to show, uh, just throw out a big thanks to the sponsors that make this possible. Um, Excel Grew, of course, my company that uh, that looks after hosting this and uh, today is providing the speaker, as well as Skillwave.Training, which is a, a division of Excel Grew and is our training platform that I run with Miguel Escobar and Matt Allington uh, to give you guys the, uh, the best possible content around self-service BI training. And, of course, Microsoft for helping us out with, uh, with the different things that they do as well. Um, it's a, a huge help to us, and I wouldn't be doing it without uh, the support that I get from them. Uh, next meetups, just to let you guys know what's coming up, we're going to have two coming up pretty quickly here. In two weeks on the Excel track, I've got my friend John Peltier, um, who is uh, one of the world's charting experts in Excel, is going to be giving us a topic about thinking smart and graphically and statistically. Um, looking forward to this. John always has good insights to share around charting. Uh, this one is going to start at 6, and the main presentation is pretty much going to start around that time because we don't do a what's new in Power BI with that one, so it's just going to dive into Excel. Uh, one thing that I would suggest, though, is that John has requested at the end of the meetup that we be able to have time once the presentation's over to sit down, have a beer, and just chat. So um, that is open to people as well. If you want to chat with, a, with an Excel legend, uh, you can absolutely do that. And then um, one week later, so normally we go with, uh, with uh, we'd be doing a week following, but we don't want to do that. It's quite so close to Christmas. Uh, we have Scott Helmers is going to be coming. Scott is a Visio MVP, and he is going to be giving us a session with data analytics in Visio, uh, working with uh, Excel and Power BI and Visio. So this is going to be a an interesting kind of tie-in with multiple products around here as well. So I'm excited to uh, see that one coming up uh, as well. And then Joseph will give us. Uh, his roundup of uh, probably what happened during the year with Power BI, depending on how far he gets through the stuff uh, in this session. Uh, I do want to throw out a couple of events that are coming up uh, along the way here, too. Um, coming up in February, there is a big uh, Global Excel Summit uh, presentation that's going to be going on with all kinds of different Excel rock star speakers here. Um, I'm actually on the featured list, even though my picture is not actually in there as well. But uh, this is an event, and if you actually go and use the coupon code here, you can get 10% off up to December 30th, uh, or sorry, December 23rd, my bad. So you can uh, you know, make yourself an early Christmas present of that. I'd invite you to check it out. It's going to be full of all kinds of good stuff. There's, uh, I mean, I'm just looking at the, the lineup of photos across the top there, and I know most of these people. This is going to be a, an absolutely um, awesome uh, a session here as, as well. So. Uh, PASS is another uh, organization that helps us out. If you'd like to become a PASS member, please go and get your membership at PASS.org. Uh, this helps you uh, hook into the data community, so it's a, a great thing to uh, to have behind you as well. And um, I hear somebody's got their mic on right now, so if I can get you guys to, uh, to mute that for me, that would be fantastic. Um, the last thing I just want to sort of throw out here, or second to last thing before we go through, is uh, we have... 
uh, sort of uh, made a hybrid on this guy here as far as uh, focusing on both Excel and Power BI tracks. The Microsoft community or Microsoft uh, Excel group is actually trying to get some uh, more information about Excel user groups. So if you really like Excel user groups, uh, please go and actually fill out their survey. It's only five questions long. They're just trying to get a little bit of an idea here to spin up more Excel user groups uh, along the way here and, and try and get people involved in these things. And they really want to find out what you want and, and things like that. Um, what's actually cool here is I can actually see a couple of people uh, that are attending here who uh, are already on the route to becoming a, um, a user group leader as well. So that's uh, kind of a cool thing. So. Uh, the final thing that I'm going to uh, to throw out here, I think this is my final slide, is if you would like to present, if you'd like to get involved, uh, it doesn't even have to be a full session long. We can do lightning talks or whatever else. Fill out our little form, our, our little survey over here, and let's figure out how we can actually get you speaking at VanPug. We love to have people come in and, and speak here, share the, the things that they've done. It's a friendly group. They never say anything negative. Uh, there's lots of stuff that goes in the chat when people are asking questions around stuff. Uh, it's a great place to actually be and present. And uh, I mean, we're really proud of the community we have. So if you got stuff you think is cool, come and share it with us. We would love to. Just fill out the survey and we'll, uh, we'll see if we can't get you scheduled. All right. Now, at this point, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Joseph, I'm going to turn this over to you and we're going to kick off the uh, what's new in Power BI slide. Uh, let me change some decks and be ready when you're done. So it is okay. yours, Frank. Cool. Yeah, I'm just going to get it up and running. Uh, come on. There we go. All right. So yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ken, uh, for the introduction and welcome everybody. Another month of Power BI and uh, another great presentation at the Meetup Group. Uh, so I'm I'm really lucky this month that I actually have two months worth of what's new content to present. Uh, the meetup group last month, we just missed the October uh, release of Power BI. So uh, last month I presented September. This month I'm going to try and fit in uh, some of my highlights, some of my favorite updates from both the October and the November release. Uh, and as Ken said a little bit earlier, when, uh, when I do my last one of these uh, in December, uh, if I miss anything today or run out of time, I may, uh, I may carry some stuff over, but we'll just see how it goes. Just before I jump in, uh, a little bit about me. For those of you who don't know, my name is Joseph Yates. Um, for the last year and a little bit, I've been presenting the What's New in Power BI at the beginning of all the Power BI meetup groups in Vancouver. Um, I've also presented previously um, a lot on using R in Power BI, so R visuals and R manipulation and some predictive analytics as well and how we can bring that into Power BI. Uh, my day job, I'm a data analyst at Blue Shore Financial in North Vancouver, uh, and I use SQL Server, R Studio, Power Query and Excel, and Power BI, of course, to do a little bit of everything with data, model, manipulate, analyze, and visualize data. Uh, my website is feathersanalytics.com, where I blog about uh, all things R, Power BI, bringing the two together. Uh, and I've also put my Twitter and my LinkedIn information up there, too. So uh, if you want to connect, if you have any questions after today or just want to talk about anything data or geeky, uh, definitely please feel free to reach out. I, I love connecting with the community. Uh, so with that, let's jump into what's new in Power BI for this month. So uh, this is my website. Uh, as I said, feathersanalytics.com. If you go to the blog uh, tab at the top, I'm going to release my October and November blog posts uh, shortly after the presentation today. Uh, as always, Microsoft have released uh, their own feature summary blog posts on their website, both for October and November. So if you want a comprehensive list of all the update um, from the releases in both October and November, these are great resources, uh, and they also have uh, a video as well that demos um, that demos a lot of these features. But where I'm going to start, I'm just going to go into a brand new Power BI um, desktop, and we can see right away if you've used any previous versions of the app, we have these canvas watermarks now. So previously, when you'd open up the Power BI app, you would just be stared with the great white 
screen of nothing. Uh, and if you were just getting into it for the first time, it was really tough to know what should I do first? Like, uh, what's the first step? How should I start using this? And um, so now we have a little bit of guidance. We can add data to our report. And once loaded, our data will, will appear in the fields pane. And if I expand that out, we can say, now we can see we haven't loaded any data. So this is, this is excellent. Um, now we have a little bit more description of how we can actually use the tool. If I go to the data view on the left-hand side, we can see the same thing, don't have any data yet. And the model view, it's giving us some options to set up our layout. Set up our layout. Uh, and also if I want to upgrade, which I thought I had done, but we can do the upgrade view as well. Uh, along with these canvas watermarks, probably my favorite thing um, about this type of update is we now have a sample data set to try. Um, if you just wanted to get up and running, try out Power BI, maybe you're coming and coming to a user group like this for the first time and you're thinking, oh, I really want to get started, but you know, I, I don't know, I don't really have any data, I just want to play around. Now we can do that within the tool itself. When you download the Power BI app, you now download a sample data set. So if I say load sample data set, it loads it straight into the app and we can start playing around with the tool uh, and become more familiar. So I'm just going to load the financial seat sheet and I'm just going to hit load there. And then it's just going to create some connections. It's going to load in the information. It's actually stored in an Excel file. Uh, and now that we've loaded some fields, we can see that the canvas watermark has changed. Now it's prompting us to build some visuals. Let's go to the fields pane and we can have a look in there as well. If I go to the model view, uh, this has been a recent update as well. This looks a little bit different than before. We now have a lot more information uh, in the actual query headers in the model view. So we have an icon next to the name uh, of the query. We can see that it's visible in the report. Uh, and there's also some updated icons next to all of the field names. Uh, we can now see, we can now see um, what's like a descriptive column, what's a measure or a numeric column, uh, as well as uh, a date column. And if we open it up in the fields on the right hand side, we have these icons as well uh, with a lot more helpful drop down list of options. So um, if, if you do create data models within Power BI and you are using some of these features, it just becomes a lot clearer um, of exactly how you can dig in uh, and really they're grouping together uh, like features. So this is a way better experience now than it was previously. Uh, another update which I really liked uh, was automatic table detection when connecting to an Excel workbook. So what I mean by this uh, is previously, if you wanted Power BI to automatically recognize a table in Excel, it had to be uh, formatted in an Excel table like this is, um, or had to be a named range. Now uh, in my sheet two, I have a table that's just sort of floating around in the middle of the workbook. Uh, but if I want to go ahead and connect to that, I'm just going to connect to my demo workbook. Uh, when this comes up and in this connection pane, when it connects to the Excel report, this navigator pane, I now have a few different options. So this is the experience what happened before. We have that actual table that was in the workbook, as well as the raw sheets underneath. But now we also see suggested tables. So these are things that aren't explicitly formatted as tables in Excel, but it's recognized that, hey, this thing in sheet two, that's probably a table, so let's connect to that. Uh, and if I select this and I go into the Power Query Editor, we can see that it actually spins off some cool applied steps for us right away. So if I click back through, just by connecting to it, we see source, navigation so that's pretty standard we're connecting to excel but then it uh, filtered out null and white space automatically it removed bottom rows from the report which we didn't need and now we have uh, an automatically detected table without having to go through uh, and do some of these steps ourselves so just another way to get um, a much better experience connecting to excel data uh, and i see donald in the chat said yes excel tables json better exactly um, this this exact same feature happened for json as well um, so i haven't um, i haven't actually played around with that 
but I saw in the blog post that this was happening both for um, Excel and JSON, so, so that's a great point. Uh, is this feature coming to Excel Power Query? Uh, I imagine it will. Ken would have a better idea of that and the release cadence um, of Excel behind Power BI, and he's actually answering your question in the chat right now. So I'm just going to uh, close and apply these uh, and load it to my model. But those were a lot of the main um, aesthetic changes to the app, a lot better experience now, uh, and a lot better for first time or beginner users to get up and running. I'm going to jump into my other example. So this was uh, same data set and demo that I used last month. Uh, and I just want to show off a, a few more of my favorite features. So um, it wouldn't be another month of Power BI updates if there wasn't an update to a Q&A or um, at one of the AI visuals. So one of the ones that I like is we have our Q&A visual here. So this allows us to type in natural language querying questions of our data set, uh, and we can get responses. But for now, I'm just going to say, OK, what is the current balance of account by product? And we get this nice visual. And so I would usually have the option to I could either um, take this visual and plop it on my report just as a bar chart like this. Um, I could go in and there's lots of options to setting up Q&A um, within the report itself. But what we can do now that I think is cool is we can actually export the data from a Q&A visual. Um, this wasn't possible before. We have had the ability to export data in a CSV from other types of visuals in Power BI, but now visuals that we that we create within the Q&A visual, we can now export that to a CSV if we just want that little subset of data, either as a package to send to our boss or a colleague, uh, or include in a data pack for a paper maybe. Um, so this is great that that's sort of coming up to speed with, uh, with some of the other visuals. Uh, another feature that I thought was really cool uh, from the November release was uh, a feature called Zoom Sliders in a visual. So I'm just going to click on my line chart in the top right-hand corner here. And I'm going to go to the format paint roller in the visualizations pane. Uh, and I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. Now we have this option to toggle on zoom slider. So I'm going to toggle that on. Actually, let's make this a little bit bigger. And now what, I, now what we can do is slide this zoom slider to just look at a subset of the visual that we want without actually applying explicit filters to our report page or to this visual itself. So if I wanted to zoom in um, between, say, 16,000 and 14,000, I could just slide these little bars, and it doesn't affect the underlying data of the report at all. It doesn't affect any other visuals on the report. We don't have to go into the filters pane. We can just actually slide these on the visual itself. And if we want to go back, I can just go and reset, or we can get a slightly different view as well. So if you really want to hone in on a specific part um, of a line chart or a bar chart, or really focus in on a specific insight, this is a really cool way to do that, um, again, without having to use filters or any magic with DAX either. Uh, speaking of the filter pane, though, uh, there was an update this month that uh, has gone from preview to general availability. Uh, and it's the ability to apply all to, it's the ability to uh, apply a lot of filters, not as soon as you set them, but sort of wait and apply them all at once. Uh, and I just see uh, Parv clarified my point in the chat. Absolutely right. It doesn't filter the data. It just zooms into the selection. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right, Parv. That's a that's a really good clarification to bring up. We're not filtering anything. It was just a way to achieve the same effect previously. We'd have to filter the data. Now we really are just zooming on the visual. So yeah, thank you for for clarifying that. Uh, but one of the options. Uh, on the filter panes, so we are talking about filters now. Uh, if we go to options and settings, and we go to options for the report, uh, and when the option pane comes up, just within the file, I'm going to go to the query reduction option. Uh, and under filters in the bottom here, 
we have the ability to add a single apply button to the filter plane pane to apply changes at once. So I'm going to toggle that on. And after I hit OK, we're going to see a new button appear down here at the bottom of the filter pane, uh, right at the bottom, which is apply. So if I wanted to apply some filters on this page, like if I wanted to narrow down the client age just to 19 to 24 year olds, we can see I, I selected it, but nothing happened in, in, in my report. Uh, if I also wanted to change the client segment, say just to segments three and four, again, I click these and nothing happens. But if I hit apply, now all of a sudden, my report has updated. So these only take, uh, take effect when I hit that apply button. The report doesn't update every time we go through the filters and apply a slightly different setting to these filters. It's the same thing when we uncheck, nothing updated. I have to wait and hit apply, uh, and then the visuals um, update as soon as I hit this apply button. Uh, the very last thing I wanted to cover today um, was probably my favorite feature from the November release, which is anomaly detection. Um, so this is, um, I've only started playing around with this a little bit, but this is really cool. This is another AI feature within Power BI. Uh, so I'm just going to look at my line chart in the top left-hand corner here. Uh, and I'm going to drop that filter pane down and I'll get rid of fields. If I go to the visualizations uh, pane on the right and I go to the analytics, this little magnifying glass, now at the bottom we have find anomalies. So I'm going to scroll there and I'm going to hit add. Uh, and by default, uh, the sensitivity is at 70% and it hasn't found any anomalies. But if I increase that, let's say to 90% sensitivity, it still hasn't found any anomalies. Man alive, come on. And it still hasn't found any. Let me update the filter a little bit. Uh, let's also see if this works. I had it working earlier. There we go. I just missed one segment. So we can see an anomaly down here. It's identified that this is outside of the expected range of values. So if I click on this, a pane pops up here. And it says the current balance was unexpectedly low for this quarter. It has a value of um, almost 16 million, which is below the expected range of about 16 and a quarter to 16 and a half million. Then it gives us some possible explanations just based on the on the uh, fields that are already in the in this visual or filters on the report page. So we have client age, client segment, and account product. But I also have the ability if I want to only explain by account product. I can drop a field into the explain by well down here and hit apply. And then we can see that, uh, well, it's only 22% strength, but maybe is investments is a possible explanation. And if I drop this up uh, or if I expand this area, we can see it's unusually low for this quarter, which, which, may have, which may explain this difference in balance overall. So again, this is really cool AI out of the box feature that can drive better insights from Power BI. Um, without needing to do any coding or advanced analytics yourself. It's, it's this new anomaly detection. Uh, so I went a little bit over, um, but I covered pretty much all the features um, that I wanted to today. So thank you, everybody, for your time. Um, I'm really excited to see Ken's presentation, even though he's been speaking for uh, most of today. But I know that he could probably go for three days straight talking about Excel and Power BI. So I know he's going to do a great job. Probably. Probably, yeah. Probably yeah. has been has been known to happen. Hey, uh, uh, this is true. Before you go, though, you got a question yeah. in the chat about the uh, the oh. Zoom window. Can you set it back to maximum, or do you have to manually drag all the things? Uh, that is a great question. Um, I think uh, I've not actually looked at that uh, specifically. I know that if you just toggle it off, it will go back to maximum. Um, I, I would have to read. I would have to read up to see if there was a way to quickly reset that. I'm not sure off the top of my yeah. head. Par Parv's agreeing with you. Doesn't look like he uh, he knows one either. So, um, yeah. so there you go. Um, All right. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to go and take over the screen again. Thanks for doing that. Um, you know, good. the good news for uh, the good news for me on this one is that it doesn't look like I got to go and re-record my Power BI videos quite yet. That makes sense. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Uh, yet. Although I'll tell you a funny story. I was actually recording a video for my uh, for my self-service BI bootcamp, 
and I recorded it and I had a white screen when I created a new Power BI file and then I shut it down. I went for lunch. I came back, booted Power BI up again and I had the, the, the nice little tiles there with all the colors. And I'm like, you updated in the middle of my day when I'm shooting videos? You got to be kidding me, right? So anyway, uh, it is what it is. It. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> it's it's all good though, right? I mean, you know, I, I will say this is that, I mean, I love the pace of change in this stuff now. I mean, I remember the days where we had, uh, you know, so much stuff that was, you know, three, four years in, in, uh, in the making with nothing happening. And then this massive overall, I, I love this. This is great. I mean, I wouldn't change it for the world, even though sometimes it can be a little frustrating for content providers, but hey. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do now is we're going to go and uh, and jump in and we're going to talk a little bit about merging magic with Power Query. Uh, I am going to tell you, just a full disclosure here, I am going to run my demos in Excel for this thing, and the main reason is because on the Excel worksheet, I can actually see multiple data sources all at the same time, whereas in Power BI, they tend to sort of be one query at a time, and I actually want to be able to see these things together. So all of the techniques that I'm going to show you here work just fine in Power BI. Thank you very much. The only difference is the interface that you're going to be seeing is gray and green instead of gray and yellow. So that's basically the, uh, the main gist of this one. Um, one comment I did want to sort of make before we dive into this thing here, um, Faraz, you were actually asking about whether or not a uh, specific uh, feature would come into, uh, into Power Query at some point in time. Um, the answer on that one is usually yes. It typically gets um, you know, uh, released in, in Power BI first and then stabilized, and once it's sort of you know, uh, completed, released, and, and is not in preview anymore at that point, then takes about usually somewhere between three and six months before it ends up actually coming into the uh, into the Excel desktop product in the beta channel and then starts rolling through. So um, I haven't heard specifically on that particular feature. Um, having said that, I also haven't heard that it's not. So, you know, I mean, for what it's worth, I my expectation is it would roll through into that. And that's typically the, the train that we see. All right. So, Here's what's going to happen. Let's let's move into this one here. I'm going to go through a bunch of different uh, different selections here and uh, and whatnot. Um, so uh, what I'd want to take a look at in this uh, in this um, sort of presentation here is I want to go through and show you a whole bunch of different techniques that we can use, either that require merges or replicate merges inside Power Query. So taking different data sets to make things work. So we're going to start with this one here. This is the real basics. And I'm not going to go deep into this because this has been around for a long time. But this particular slide here you can see is seven ways to join your data. I have two tables here in the middle. I've got a transactions table. I've got a chart of accounts table. The big thing that's important about this is that one should only be, if you're, if you're not familiar with accounting, is that the chart of accounts are the buckets that we use to post transactions to in the accounting world. I've got two yellow items in the chart of accounts, and these are account department combinations that exist in my chart of accounts that don't have any transactions posted to them. Now, any accountant will tell you, eh, we don't really care. I mean, we've got accounts there, somebody hasn't used them, eh, whatever, it doesn't hurt our feelings at all. But on the left side of the table, we have our transactions, and there's a couple of red rows in those ones. Now, the red rows indicate a de an account department combination where somebody's posted a transaction, but there's no entry in the chart of accounts for this. And this is really, really bad. And that's why they're red. Okay, We need to know about these kind of things. So my job as an accountant is to go and actually reconcile these two things to figure out where the mismatches actually are, where what's matching, what's not matching. And we've got seven different ways inside Power BI to make a join in this particular case. The first one, uh, what's known to SQL pros as the left outer join, is what, as an Excel pro, you would kind of look at as a VLOOKUP join. You would go and you would say, okay, I want all the transactions from the left-hand side, and I want all of the transactions from the right-hand side that actually have a match. Okay, So that's the, the first one. To say You can replicate that by writing VLOOKUPs in your transactions to look up your chart of, chart of accounts and bring back the correct you know, answer. We also have something called a right outer join, which is basically just doing it from the other side. Give me all the records in the chart of accounts and only the matching transactions. So no red records would be pulled back across from this. Um, and for our yellow records that don't have any matches, we would just return an empty space. In Excel, you'd return hash NA. Okay, so just slightly different there. 
We also have this cool little joint here called a full outer joint. And what the full outer joint does, it actually takes all rows from both tables and puts them together and shows holes where there's no matches. And this can be a really useful one. Uh, it's something that Excel um, didn't offer by default and yet with Power Query now does, which is pretty cool. Uh, so it's also a useful joint type to have uh, in your arsenal. Um, in this case, you would see all the blue and white records, you'd see the red ones, you'd see the yellow ones, everything would be there, which would be great. We have the opposite of that, which is an inner join. And the inner join basically says, I only want to see matching records between these. So no red records, no yellow records, just give me the blue and whites that actually match up perfectly. Okay, so um, this is a, a really useful one. If I'm you know, in accounting and I'm trying to figure out what checks have cleared the bank, this is my listing for that, which ones actually worked exactly the right amounts. And then we get into the special stuff that you know, actually really gets my juices going as an accountant because every reconciliation job where you're comparing two lists, most of the time you don't care about what matches. You care about what doesn't match. I don't care that we've got records that are actually working here. What I care about is give me the list of the red records and the list of the yellow records so that I can figure out what's going on. And for this reason, they added these ones in called a left anti-join. And the left anti-join gives me only the red records, which won't, don't have any matches on the other side. And for the same token, a right anti-join, which gives us only the yellow records and won't give us any of the others. Okay, So things that exist in one table that just don't exist in the other. Now, that's the six joins that Excel and Power BI support natively. But the slide says seven. So what's missing? It's this one which I think is one of the most important join types to actually have here, and it is called the full anti-join. Because to me, if I'm trying to compare two lists, this right here is what I want. Tell me all of the red and yellow records. I don't care about the stuff that matched. I want to know about these things that actually don't. And I'll give you a demo of, uh, of this one in a little bit here. Now, um, I'm not actually going to demo the first one I'm going to show you. I'm just going to show you this is my sort of overarching, uh, and it's based on my Power Query recipe cards that I actually have. But I just want to show you this guy here. So here's the first um, piece that I'm actually looking at with things. I've got a source table up in the upper left with a date, a product ID, and some units. And down in the bottom right, I've got a, a table, a lookup table that has a product ID and a sales price. And in the middle, you can see I'm trying to build a table that has the date, the product ID, units, and the sales price. Now, this one would be, um, to a database person, would be what we call a left outer joint. Give me all the records from the source table with the matching sales prices based on the product ID from the lookup table. For an Excel person, this is VLOOKUP exact match. Go and get me the VLOOKUP and give me the exact item that I'm actually looking for. So I'm not going to demo this because this has been around for a long time. There's a couple of different ways to deal with it. But the thing that's important is that this is the default join type inside Power BI and Excel with Power Query. This is what you're going to go to right off the bat here. The big key to success for this, though, the recipe that we work with when we go through and you're preparing your source table, you set your data types, you load it as a connection only, so there's a staging table. Um, I don't actually do my merges directly in my raw data connection. That leads to formula firewall errors and other problems. I'm going to prepare my lookup table by setting the data types. And then here's the important part. You right-click your key column and remove the duplicates. Now, you don't want to do that if it's going to eat data, but if you're trying to do a lookup, this is a really important part. And I'm going to show you an example later why this becomes a problem if you don't actually do it. You'll notice again with my lookup table, I load it as connection only. I'm not actually doing any merging directly inside this table. And then what I'll do is I'll reference the source table, go to home, merge my lookup table, select my key columns on both, use a left outer, and then just expand the new columns. The reason why I set up with this with two individual staging tables and then do a reference and a merge is that I now have a very clear audit trail of what's going on. I have an uncompromised data source in, in uh, both of my original staging tables. And if I ever need to make changes, I have a really clean place to go and actually do that. So this is kind of the base one. I'm going to get into some more complicated ones in, uh, in a little bit here, starting with this guy here, the full anti-join. So here's what's going to happen. We've got a source table. You can see that I've got this red record here. It has no matching item in my account, in my chart of accounts table. There's no 64015, but I have an amount for it. Meanwhile, over in my lookup table, I have an account 64025, the revenue for senior nine green fees, that doesn't have any transactions posted to it. So what I want is I want to be able to pull a list that shows me both of these things. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and build this whole thing up and show you exactly how it works. So I'm going to hop over to, as I said, Excel. Oop, I'm going to try and tab the correct number of times to get there. There we go. So here is some data that I'm actually working with. Okay, so I've got my transactions table. I've got my chart of accounts table. Now, I'm just going to go and quickly show my, uh, my queries pane here because I've actually created all of these things already um, right off the bat. Uh, the first thing you'll notice is that I've actually pulled my transactions table into Power Query here, and it's going to go and load its, uh, its preview. So there we go. Nice. Um, you'll notice that it's loaded to connection only. This is not landed to a table because I already have it in a table anyway. I don't need it again. My chart of accounts table, which I've called COA because I'm just far too lazy to type out that massive amount. I mean, sorry, sorry far too efficient to type out chart of accounts, um, looks like this. Okay, There's nothing really massive going on inside this guy here. And then what I've done is I've actually created all of the different join types that are available here. When you actually run them through, the left outer join would look like this. All of the records from the first table with the matches from the others, and then Power Query will land out blanks for the stuff that doesn't match. So I can see that these two don't actually have an account. The right outer join would look like this. This was my two yellow messages or two yellow items here that didn't have any transactions. These guys in left outer, these were the red transactions. Okay. Now, the full outer ends up looking like this. So we can see the gaps where things don't match. Right? So that's helpful. The inner ignores the red and the yellow and it just gives me the plain old everything that did match. And then we get into the important ones. Left ante that says, just show me the stuff that didn't have a match. Right ante that also shows me just the stuff that didn't have a match. And then the one that I actually want, which is this. All right, so how do we build these? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna demo the building of the full outer join first, and then we'll look at the left ante, right ante, full ante. So I'm gonna start with the table that I want on the left-hand side, which is transactions. So I'm going to go right click and I'm going to choose to reference it. What you will notice is that I am not going directly to emerge. And while this will work, I don't do it. The reason being is because when I do a reference, what happens is I'm going to get a nice new step inside my query editor right here that says source, which points to the transactions table. Okay, so here we go. So when I now go up here and say merge queries, I'm going to get a new step that indicates that there's a merge. If I go back to Excel and I just do a right click and merge right away, I get one step. So the audit trail is not as clear. There's no performance difference whatsoever. I prefer to have a clear audit trail for somebody who's reading this code because ultimately when I build one of these solutions, I want to do what my favorite thing is to do with work and that is delegate it to somebody else to maintain. So the clearer it is, the less likely it's going to come back to my desktop. All right, so here's what's going to happen. Uh, we can go and we can merge it to any one of these tables that I've created, including merging it to itself. We'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to merge it to the COA. And what I need to do is I actually need to merge based on an account department combination. So here's the one tricky piece around this. I need to have a, a unique entry on one side. It's going to be in the chart of accounts that essentially works like this, 64010 64010-250, 64030-150, 64030-150, and so forth. The idea here is I'm trying to come up with a unique entry. When we look at this one, 64010, 64010, these are not unique. So if I try and merge against these, I'm going to end up with a problem. So I need to put these together. Now, the thing is, is that I can do that by dropping back to Power Query and merging two things with a delimiter, but I actually don't want to do that. So here's a little trick for merging multiple columns. I can hold down my control key and select another column and you'll notice I get a little one, two. So if this is a new one to you, this basically treats these two columns as if they're one unit with an implied delimiter. So I don't have to go and create a new column first. So I'm gonna go over here to account. I'm gonna hold down control and click department. You'll notice we get the one, two option with this one as well. The important thing to realize here, these columns do not have to have the same names between the tables. They don't even have to be in the same order. I could have department first and account second, providing that I select account first so that it is item number one and department is number two. Okay, So the order of the, the columns is irrelevant, but the order that I select them is going to be important. And at this point, it says, let's use join kind left outer. I'm going to match six out of eight rows. 
Uh, it is entirely possible to have a number here that doesn't do a one-to-one -one match. It still gives you a one-to-one -one because we're working with previews, but in this case, it really doesn't match. So that's all good. I'm going to go and choose full outer. Still tells me six to eight rows and six to eight rows from the other table. I'm going to say OK, and it's going to create this for me. We get a new blank row showing up in the middle of our original table. And the reason being is because if I come over and click over here in the white space, you'll notice that this gives me those two yellow records that didn't have any transactional matches. So this is basically what it's saying is, I didn't have a match for these. Instead of giving you a hash NA like good old Excel would do, I'm going to give you nulls instead blank. And they load as empty to the Excel table when I eventually load it, or to the Power BI table if you're working in Power BI. What I'm now going to do, I'm going to expand this. And this is important if you're trying to do matches. We actually take all the columns, even though we have account and department over here. And at this point, I am going to use the original column name as prefix because I can't have two account columns in one table. The reason why you keep all your columns is because I don't have an account or a department here, so I need to know what the account and department are over here or else I lose that information. And if I was trying to actually sort of, you know, build something that was actually trying to fill these things in, what I might do now is run an if statement to say, if this is negative or if this is null, then give me this one. Otherwise, give me the one on the left hand side, which I know is a match. OK, so so that's the left outer joint. Now, here's the cool thing about this, though, is that I can actually flip this whole thing up simply by going back and changing the joint type. So if I go back to merge queries and I go and click on the gear icon. I can try any one of these that I want. So if you're not really like super locked in as to which query you or which join type you want, what you do is you start maybe with one and then you go, you know what, let me try the left ante. Let's see what happens. I'll join that. Oh, I only got two rows. Go to expanded. No, no, no. Okay, cool. That looks great. Let me try a different one. We'll go back to the gear again and we'll try right ante. One of the things I love about Power Query, you never blow up your original data. So you can actually click anything in here, and you can always delete the step afterwards if it goes horribly wrong. This right here is the right anti join, and it's the most freaky of the join types because every time you do a right anti join, it always looks like this. And this is where people freak out because they go, "Well, I got nothing. Like it's just no, 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 no." Well, absolutely, because. In our nested table here, these are the records that had no transactions. So it's basically saying I've got one row with no transactions, but I've got this nested table because it applies to more than one account. And when we actually go and expand that, you'll see that it actually gives me this nicely with all of these individual different rows. But it's kind of a freaky one if you're not expecting that. All right, now, I want to go and take a look at, at this over here just to prove something out to you. Here's my left anti-join. You'll see that I've got source, merge queries, expanded COA, and I've got my right anti join. There we are. So it's actually giving me these guys. These are the ones that I originally built. And then I wanted to build this guy here, the full anti join. The trick with this one is to make sure that your column headers are the same between these two tables. Notice how they're exactly the same. So what I'm going to do in the full anti on the source step is I've referenced left anti. Okay, right there. Basically, I just right clicked on it and chose reference. And then what I did is I went and appended the right ante to it. Okay, so basically from the original step of source, it was just a straight out append queries. There we go. And then I chose the left or the right ante join on top of it. That's how you get a full ante join. Nice and simple. And it's actually something I wish that uh, the Power BI team or the, uh, the Power Query team would actually uh, go in and build in by default because it's such a useful join. And uh, I don't know any uh, other product that actually does this one by default either. So it'd be kind of a nice one. So uh, that is the basics of how the full ante join works. Now, this one's I would say probably uh, outside of the full ante is, is probably fairly straightforward. Most people sort of get these, and it's just a matter of changing that one piece. Um, but the, the full ante is, is kind of a little bit more tricky. And to say, once you've got it, though, it refreshes nicely, and, uh, and we're good to go there. So um, the trick with the full ante is to say it's not available in the user interface. You have to create it manually. And basically, this is what the secret is for this. You create your left anti join, you create your right anti join, you expand all fields from the joined key column, ensure the names and columns are identical, 
load them as, as uh, connection-only stage inquiries, or you can load them to your data model if you want, and then you append the two together. And at that point, you now have your full anti-join. Um, I find this super, super useful. I use this all the time when I'm comparing lists and it works absolutely fantastic. Now, that's the first one. This this stuff here, um, uh, yeah, Faraz, I 100% agree. Totally should be available in the in the, uh, in the defaults. But um, you know what? It's not. So good news is I get to uh, to share the pattern with people. So there you go. And that's what uh, that's what we're doing here. So um, so uh, and awesome, Donald. Use it tomorrow. Cool. Love it. That's excellent. I love love to hear that. Make an impact out of this stuff. That's that's good. It's feel good for the end of the day for me. Uh, all right. Let's go and take a look at another one. I got this guy over here. So. This one is kind of an interesting and special, uh, special little pattern as well. For my next trick, what I want to do is I want to take the two tables on the left and I want to create the table on the right. So you'll notice that I've got some colors, spelt the good old Canadian or, or English way of, of doing things. Um, I've got red, black, and blue. And I've got some products, truck, car, and van. And what I want is I want a table that shows me every product in every color that I have. This is actually called a Cartesian product or a cross join. Uh, there's, there's a variety of different uh, um, words for it uh, along the way. If you build it when you're not expecting to it, those words start to become less descriptive and more profane because it's a little bit confusing. Uh, but let's go and take a look at where we can actually use the power of a Cartesian product or a cross join uh, in an interesting way for good here. So here's what I have. I have a little budget table. So I've got some expenses that I actually need to go and budget. I got hydro, some rent, office supplies, cable, and telephone. Now, the deal with these is that for my budget, these expenses are a fixed amount that happens every single month. I've got a, uh, I'm on a hydro plan that I pay the same amount every month. I've got a, a fixed amount of rent. Uh, somehow I manage to use the exact same amount for pencils and supplies every month. My cable bill is pretty predictable. And my telephone, well, I just got the basic connection because I never talk on the phone because I use Teams, right? So we've got some predictability around these expenses. And what I need to do is I need to go and build myself a nice little budget for each of these. And I want the same thing for every single month. So I'm going to actually use a nice little trick inside Power Query to do this. And I'm going to show you this actually in two different ways, because one of them is going to illustrate exactly why we deduplicate a table before we go and do our work with it. So I'm just going to go and show the, uh, the query editor over here. Um, hydro, uh, is that the water bill? You're American. Um, okay, no, hydro is power in Canada. Actually, it's hydroelectric power. We're, we're, uh, we're big on this one as compared to nuclear power. So. Um, Hopefully that makes some sense. There we go. Awesome. I, I'm always uh, always happy to uh, to educate Americans as to uh, our weird language up here, and especially how to use a U in the word color. So um, let me help you with that one. So uh, so here we go. I've got uh, two. <laughs> um, yeah, the Z28. You guys are going to say Z28, aren't you? Yeah, it's just just horrible. Um, anyhow, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about what I've got here. So I've set up two tables. I've got my uh, my expense table over on the left hand side. If I go and click on the table design, you can see I've called it expenses. Over here, I've got a nice little table called dates. And I've created my power queries that are actually going, uh, going in, and they're just pulling this data in. So there's nothing super magic about what's going on here. But here's what I'm going to do right now. I am going to go and just double click on one of these guys because I'm going to jump in and I'm going to make a, an edit to these particular tables. I'm going to add a new column to my expenses table and to my dates column or table. And I'm just going to do that right now by going to custom column. And I'm doing this. This is not the way I would do this normally. I just want to sort of demo this one here so you get the idea of what's going on. It's going to be called merge key and it's going to be a highly technical formula. It's equals one. Okay. So we just get one on every single column here. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to set the data type to a whole number two just to make sure that nothing blows up on me. I'm going to go over to dates over here as well. And I'm going to go to custom column and I'm going to do exactly the same thing here. We're going to say merge key and I'm going to make this one equal to one. And there we go. We'll say, okay. And I'll set this to be also a whole number. All right. Now I now want to merge these two tables together. So the deal is though, with this, of course, when I look at this, the reason why I set up the merge key is because there's nothing here to merge to dates. But if I create a merge key, that's got one all the way down it, and I add a one over here, I now have something I can merge that I'm going to get an exact match. Okay? So hopefully that makes some sense. So let's start with our expenses here. I'm going to go right click. And once again, 
Uh, these guys are loaded to connection only. I'm going to choose to reference it. So I'm going to make a new query here, which is called budget. Awesome. And now what I'm going to do, I've got my individual step for source. I'm now going to go and I'm going to add my merge step. There we go, merge. And now we'll go and grab our dates and we'll choose to merge against the merge key. Notice that it matches five out of five rows from the first table. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is not because I do this this way, because I don't, but the thing I want you to recognize is that every row here has a one. Every row here has a one, which means that when I merge from the expenses table and say, I'd like you to merge based on this number, it's going to go back and it's going to pick up every one from the other table. It doesn't pick up the first one. It's not an implicit intersection or anything like that. This brings back every single item in a nested table. This is what we call a Cartesian product or a cross join. Now the challenge with this is not when you expect it. It's when you don't. If you go and merge on the wrong keys and you have du or if you have duplicate data in one table where you didn't expect it, you suddenly, when you expand stuff, pop out with a whole bunch of extra rows. I'm not gonna expand the merge key because I don't need it, but what you're gonna watch is this table is gonna go boom, it's gonna be huge because we get every single row. So if you have duplicated items where you didn't expect it, you can suddenly end up increasing the size of your data set by accident, okay? So that's one of the reasons why in the left outer join, I recommend you deduplicate your lookup table. Now let me show you another way to go back and deal with this though. So I'm gonna delete this and I'm gonna go back to my expenses and I'm gonna delete this step and the added custom. So we're gonna go back to the original table. And let me show you the recipe for how I really make a Cartesian product. So from budgets, or uh, my budget query is just equals expenses. There's nothing super special here. When I do this, I always make sure that the queries pane is available on the left-hand side. Now, no big deal if you're working in Power BI because it's always open, but in Excel, for whatever reason, the engineers decided that this should be collapsed when you're working with it. I wish we could pin this open because honestly, I use this all the time. The reason I do is because I want to see the spelling of what's going on over here. Because I'm gonna to go to add column, custom column. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna say dates. I want the exact name of the table from over here. Now, fortunately, um, we may not all have this. I'm not sure how far this is actually rolled through. This started in Power BI, but we do have IntelliSense in Excel's uh, Power, uh, Power Query windows now. Um, and it works just as well, has the same problems as well. Uh, but at this point, if I now go and say, okay, you'll notice I get a table. And for each table that we see here, it brings back the entire table and puts it in the cell. So we're getting the exact same effect if I'd actually add, added the, um, the merge key first and then merged it with that Cartesian product, this is the same thing. We're just pulling in a nest, uh, best nested table. And um, Joseph's uh, giving me the big thumbs up on this. He loves this um, for, for cross sales reports. It was probably killing him watching me add those merge keys to get to the same place. So um, fortunately, Joseph knows that I usually have a method to my madness, but not always, right? So uh, at any rate, um, at this point, I'm not gonna bother using the original column name as prefix. You'll notice that I didn't even rename the column when I actually built it because I didn't need it, right? So now when I expand it, boom, now I've got the same information. The one thing that really is kind of frustrating this, I have to reset the data types. It doesn't bring those across, although I'm hoping one day that they'll actually get that sorted out. But at this point, I've now got a beautiful little Cartesian product here. So, I mean, you know, if I was being really, uh, really, really careful with this, uh, what I would do is I would actually mark this one here down as a specific type of budget. This is kind of my, you know, straight line budget or whatnot, because obviously if I'm building a budget, I've also got variable expenses and I can't do that with, uh, with those because I get the same thing every single month. But the cool thing here is I can build separate tables for this. One for the nice, easy straight line. I mean, how long does it take to build that when you're doing it at speed? Not long. And then we could build another one for the more complicated stuff and then just append the two together and boom, now we've got exactly what we're looking for. So if I go and see, I can't see when I'm doing this, here we go. There's my budget. So if I decide that I'm gonna go and add something else in this one, let's say that you know I have a, uh, a really important, oh, actually, you know what, I should do this. Let's, uh, let's talk about my coffee habit for my monthly coffee spend, right? Uh, this is the beans that I use to grind it myself. And now all I need to do is go back and say refresh 
And what we should see is that I should now be able to get my coffee expenses put into my budget as well, just like that. So um, fantastic little, uh, little trick along the way in order to, uh, to make this thing work. As I say, the big, big component that I want to make sure that you don't forget about in this, though, it is very easy to accidentally create yourself a Cartesian product if you haven't deduplicated your merge. When you're trying to do it, it's awesome. When you're not trying to do it, it's not awesome, right? It just gets very, very confusing. So watch out for that little, uh, little challenge there um, along the way. Uh, so if I go back and just take a look at the, uh, the slide here for this one here, there is the, uh, the recipe. Um, we basically reference table one. We add a custom column, leave the name as custom. The formula is equal the name of the other table, and then expand the new column with unchecking the preface option. Super easy recipe in this particular one here. All right, next up, go with this little challenge. So, I don't know how many of you guys have, uh, have relatives that, uh, that come from the UK, but one of the things that I've discovered about um, relatives that come from the UK is they always refer to McDonald's as McDonald's. And you'd think that they'd be close enough to Scotland that they would know that the Scots don't like that. Or maybe that's why they do it, I don't know. At any rate, the issue that I've actually got here is that those two things obviously don't match. They're not the same, as any Scott will probably tell you. So here's the deal, though. I've got a source table on the left-hand side. It's got some burgers. It's got some burgers. We got chips. We got French fry. We got fries. And the problem is that my sales list down the bottom, my actual prices, are burger, French fries, and salad. And I need to match these together to get the correct prices back. Now, there's no amount of left outer joining or right outer joining or anti-joins or Cartesian products that's going to make this work because these items don't match exactly. And this is where we're going to get into playing around with the fuzzy match. And um, this is a really kind of a cool thing. There used to be a long time ago, um, so, you know, aging myself on this, there used to be an add-in for Excel called fuzzy matching. And it was, it was kind of a neat little add-in that you could actually work with. Um, but it's now uh, one of those things that's built into Power Query came to Power BI first and is now rolled all the way through into, and I believe everybody um, on, uh, on Excel now has this in theirs as well. So let me just go and, uh, and show the uh, queries here. Uh, you'll notice that in this case here, I'm not using the food example, but I've got uh, a few different pieces here. I've got a, a procurement clerk. Uh, people are coming to them. They're asking for stuff. And this person is making manual entries into a list of employee numbers. They're making manual entries for the quantity and manual entries into the items. What could possibly go wrong with manual data entry, right? Until you go and say, okay, we need to assign costs to all of these things to charge them back to the individual departments. And what we can see here is, well, we've got one laptop, right? And we've got one monitor, right? We also have laptops. We've got mice instead of mouse. We've got screen instead of monitor. What the heck are we gonna do about this? All right, so let's go and take a look at what we got. My collected table is the one here that has the quantities in it. My pricing table is the pricing table. They're coming straight from these guys, nothing super special. So here's what's gonna happen. Right click. Once again, I'm not going to merge directly. I'm going to go to reference. I'm going to say the merge will work, you know, just to be completely clear on this. I just, it's my style to actually make sure that I've got my individual steps. And so here we go. Um, I'm going to go and call this one. Let's go with uh, chargeback, um, just because I know what I'm doing here. And this is what will eventually end up going into my data model tables. And here's what I'm going to do now is I'm going to merge this chargeback here. And I'm going to merge this against my pricing table. So I'm going to choose naturally my product is going to match to my item over here. And at this point, we can see that it's matched two out of row, six rows from the first table. So if I come over here and take a look, I'm actually going to expand all of the columns just so that we can see what actually matched and what didn't. I normally would just expand the price, but you'll notice that laptop and monitor work fine, but laptops plural did not, mice didn't, keyboards didn't, and screen didn't. All right. So I need to do some work on this. So the first thing I'm going to do is going to go back to Merge Queries, and I'm going to click the gear. The join kind of left outer is actually fine, although this will work with other join kinds as well. But most of the time, when we're trying to do a fuzzy match, we're trying to do a left outer join. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click this little box here, Use Fuzzy Matching to perform the merge. And it says, cool, we've now matched four out of six rows. Well, that's an improvement. We had two before. So let's go see. We'll click on expanded pricing here. 
And what you'll notice now is that where we had laptops, it's now matched to laptop. Uh, a bit of Zoom Plus would be great. Okay, let me see. I don't know that, um, honestly, there's a lot that I can do on this because if I go in with a big Zoom on this, it ends up really messing up Teams in a big way here. But let me see if I can, uh, yeah, nothing's going to end up going and doing anything here. So I'll try it. But as I say, um, I'm afraid that this might get a little bit nasty here. So let me uh, try and come in just a little bit. Whoa, yeah, this is not... Not exactly the ideal experience. Uh, I, I'm going to go back to 100%. I apologize for it, as he's, um, it's uh, it's a real tricky thing on this. When I'm working on one screen, uh, it's not a not a big deal. Uh, viewers can select focus or full screen. Um, Shane, uh, more uh, more information into the chat would be absolutely fantastic. Uh, you're talking the actual Teams feature itself, right? Um, yeah, I wish Power Query Editor had a Zoom option as well. Uh, yeah. So, all right, cool. So. Basically what's happened here, laptops is now matched with laptop. This is actually fairly close. Uh, control mouse wheel on your, for the viewers should be able to log in. Cool, I give that a shot as well. That's right in Teams, uh, new to me. Excellent, I love it. Um, the last thing here, keyboards can match to keyboard. Okay, so that's only one letter difference. So that's a pretty, pretty uh, similar thing. But we still have a problem with mice not being matched to mouse and with screen not being matched to monitor. So what do we do? Uh, oh, cool. Here, I'll tell you what. Let me just pull this on screen here. And let me resize this so that we can, come on, actually get it all on the screen here. So, um, geez. Uh, so what Shane's got here is uh, he's got a focus button. Um, it's right on the three dots menu on the top of your Zoom. So uh, somewhere on the top there, if you go to focus, um, you can actually pick up and hopefully get a little bit, a uh, little bit better zooming experience out of it. Thank you, Shane. I appreciate that. So, um, all right. So, uh, so here's the uh, here's the deal on this one here. Uh, I'm going to actually go and just load this right now. I'm going to go and say close and load two, and I'm going to load this off to a worksheet. I'm going to put it over here in column Q because I just want to dump this down for a second because I need a little bit more data. So. Um, the challenge that I've got at this point is that I can't match this, uh, these mice to mouse. It, it doesn't like the pluralism of that, and I can't match screen to, um, to what's actually going on on my, uh, on my monitors. So for this purpose, what we can do for our fuzzy match is we can actually add a manual translation table. The important things around this table, it has to have a from column and it has to have a to column. And then you basically say, what do I want to match from? Well, I want to match mice to mouse and screen to monitor. So here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna to go to from table, and we'll pull in our nice new translation table into, uh, into uh, Power Query here. And I'm just gonna go and say, okay, cool, that looks good, I'm happy with that. So what I'm gonna do with this, I'm now gonna go back to my chargeback and I'm gonna modify my merge queries again. And in this case here, if I can get my query to come up, I'm gonna go and expand the fuzzy matching options. And I'm gonna spin all the way to the bottom of the little uh, scrolly dialog down here. And you'll notice we have this transformation table. If you mouse over it, it's gonna tell you that you need to have a from and a to column in really small text. And uh, basically at this point in time, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick up my translation. And now we're gonna go and say, okay, and I'm getting the uh, the control shift plus zooms the power query editor. Oh man, it does. Cool. I learned something awesome. I love it in a day when uh, when we get more. Doesn't expand the ribbon, but extends the uh, the actual um, piece here as well. Thank you for that, Todd. Appreciate that. That needs to go into my book of tricks apparently. So um, that is awesome. I'm glad you came. Uh, all right. So we've zoomed this one up a little bit here. Now that I can uh, zoom it, let's see. Does it affect the dialogue? Of course, it doesn't affect the dialogue. That's not really helpful, but. Um, but at this point in time here, if I go and expand the pricing, you'll now see that my mice has been matched with mouse and my screen has been matched with monitor. Okay, so that translation table will allow us to get that from and to. So this is kind of cool. But now I'm gonna run in and there's gonna be one more problem that I actually wanna deal with as well, and that's this. I wanna build it back to a specific department. But now, um, 
<laughs> okay, that's funny, Todd. All right, so you learned it in uh, in one of the classes that my partner put together in in the product that I sell. I should really watch all of his videos again, shouldn't I? Um, awesome. Uh, all right, so uh, so here's the deal. What I want to do is I now want to actually build my table over here, and I want to be able to go through and assign this to a department. The challenge is, you can see right away, Don A. Well, whoever was recording it wrote it down as Donald A. I've got a Don B over here, no problem. I've got a Bob, I've got a Ron. I've got all kinds of different stuff here. So the question is, is how well is this going to work? So I'm going to pull this data in as well. So just from table here again for my employees. And uh, oops, there we go. So we've now got our nice little employee. It's called departments. That's fine. That'll work. So I'm going to come over to the charge back now. And at the very end of this, I'm going to go and add a new merge query step to this one here. All right. I'm going to go and merge with my departments. And I'm going to merge based on the employee number. Now, still going to use a left outer. I know that these aren't going to match, so I'm going to go straight to the fuzzy merge. And at this point in time, I'm going to go and say OK, and I'm going to expand. Again, I'm going to do all of it just so that I can see what's going on here. So you can see that this isn't bad, right? We've got Don B that's been merged to Don B. We've got Ron to Ron, Bob to Bob, Mary to Mary, Cheryl to Cheryl. That's all good, but Donald A is not being picked up. So no problem. We, we know how this works. We're just going to go back and we're going to say, cool, um, the fuzzy merge should work, right? Well, wait a minute. Didn't I just do a fuzzy merge? I thought that that should work. Hold on. Let's go take a look. Yeah, we use fuzzy matching. So the challenge here is that Don A and Donald A are not similar enough to actually pick up a threshold here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play around with this thing called the similarity threshold. Now, the similarity threshold here, the idea here, it's set to 0.8 by default. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set this down to 0.5. And it now says, hey, six out of six rows of the table have, uh, have actually been at, matched. Perfect. We're going to click OK. And now we're going to expand it. And I want to watch really carefully what happens to the number of rows. I got a new row. Wait, what? Don A is matched perfectly to Donald A. That's excellent. Bob to Bob, Mary to Mary, Ron to Ron. But then I've got Don B matched to Don B, and I've got Don B also matched to Ron. What have I just done? I've created a fuzzy Cartesian product. And this is one of the things that you have to be really, really careful about when you're going in and, uh, and fooling around with the similarity threshold that you're actually using it here is if you dial this down too much, it makes too loose a match. So it actually starts to match to the wrong things and then can potentially add records and duplicate things. So that can become a little bit of a, a challenge there. So I would say, you know, tweak the similarity threshold with extreme caution and make sure that you're actually going back and validating your results and checking them on a regular basis if you're going to do this. A better solution for this one would actually be to set up a translation table for it to go and say, look, Don A is equal to Donald A. So if we go with a from, you know, Donald A to Don A, then it would have actually matched perfectly and it wouldn't have been a, a challenge along the way there. So that's the thing that we want to uh, to watch when we're actually playing with these. Fuzzy matching is, is awesome. It's really powerful. There's a lot of cool things that we can do with it, but we also want to make absolutely certain that we don't end up in this scenario here where we accidentally create data because we've gone a little bit too far with our overall sort of matching component. Okay, so something to keep in mind when you're playing around with this. So I'm going to go and, uh, and close this guy out right now. All right, so uh, let me go back over here. So here is the deal. This is the recipe that goes for this. It's add a translation table, and it's basically, you know, you create your transformation table that has a from and a to column, merge your original two queries, and then you can start playing around with the fuzzy matching options. There's a couple of other ones in there about case sensitivity and things like that. Um, you know, but uh, but overall, the, the two things that you usually play with are the similarity threshold and adding the transformation table. The big warning, as I say, don't set your similarity too low. In the case of what you see on screen here, um, in order to get a match with French fry and fries, I had to go down to a similarity of 0.4. That is incredibly loose and dangerous. So I wouldn't actually do that. Uh, Christian's asking, is there a way to change the default green color when loading the table from Power Query? Not that it matters. Um, 
no, I think uh, I think we stick with green because we like it. It's Excel focused. Um, I, honestly, Christian, I I'm thinking that I've seen somewhere where somebody managed to hack that and change it, but I honestly can't remember. And it was it was so like low on my radar that it it didn't stick. If uh, if it did, so um, like Faraz, I love that color, so um, I'm gonna stick with it. But uh, it may be possible. Uh, Google will probably tell you. I think so. Um, if it's really that important to you. I usually change it after the fact, and then it's not a big deal. All right, next one up here. Let's talk about this one here. This is what we call the approximate match pattern. We have a source table with order ID and quantity, and then we have another column over here with quantity and price per unit. But the problem that we have is that our quantity falls between two bands of pricing. And what I want to do is I want to get the closest price without going over. Excel does this really easily with something called VLOOKUP approximate match, or if you prefer, XLOOKUP approximate match as well. I actually asked the, uh, the Power Query team for how to do this at one point in time, and they sent me back a, a massive, massive piece of code to do this. And, uh, and the response that I, I sort of gave them was, wow, that's insane. Like, why doesn't it do this by default? And they said, well, we don't think this is this common of a problem. And I was like, holy cow, man, you've never met Excel users because we do this all the time. Anyway, let's go and take a look at, uh, at what we have in this particular case here. Um, so this is replicating the VLOOKUP approximate match scenario for, uh, for what we're going to deal with here. I've got a little lookup table on the left-hand side. Let's just go and take a look and see what we got. Oh, I haven't pulled in any queries. I guess I'm going to need to grab them. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to start with this guy here. Um, we're going to go from table, and we're going to pull this one in. And basically, once I've got the table in, it all looks good. I'm going to hit close and load, and I'm going to load this to a connection only query. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to do here before I actually pull this in is I'm just going to change the name of this column here to units because I actually want to prove a point out on this one too. There's something important about this particular recipe. So I'm going to pull this one in. So this guy here is going to create me my table of orders. So there we go. That's fantastic. I'm going to hit close and load. My load defaults are set to connection only, so it will now create those right away in that color. Or, or sorry, not color. I just saw Christian's comment in, uh, in out of the corner of my eye. Uh, all right, so here's what's going to happen now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start orders over here is the table that I want on the left side of what's going on over here. So I'm going to start with that one. I'm going to go right click and I'm going to choose reference. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try and merge these two things together to get the appropriate price from the pricing table. So this is going to be my, um, I don't know, let's, let's call this one uh, transactions or something like that. Uh, that'll work. That's my favorite query name. Uh, all right. So you would naturally think that in order to merge these two things together, you would go to merge queries. And the reality of this is that if you did this, you can't make it work because there's only a, an exact matching kind of component here, left outer, right outer, or a non-match. This is a really, really weird little pattern that actually does emerge by doing something totally different. But there's a secret around making this thing work, and it's this. We need to go to our original table. We check the column names, quantity and price per unit. We go to the orders table, and we have order ID, and we have units. This one here, the units column, is what I'm going to be doing the lookup on versus quantity. So these two columns need to be called the exact same thing. So I'm going to go and rename units. Even though I renamed it in the Excel grid, I'm going to rename it back here, uh, quantity, and it has to be exactly the same. Okay. And now, here's the tricky fun part. In order to merge this, here's what we do. We're in our orders table. We go to append queries not merge, and we append the prices table. Now the prices table, remember, had one column that was the same and two that were different. Or sorry, one that was the same, one that was different. The price, it had a price per column. What happens is these two things get stacked on top of each other, but for the column that is common, it stacks all the data in the same column. But notice that our order ID here from our original orders table, it didn't have a price per unit, so it says, I don't know what those are. I'll fill them in with null. But down here, I have these price per units, but I don't know what the order ID number is, so I'm going to fill those ones in with null as well. So this is actually pretty handy here. So what I'm going to do at this point 
is I'm now going to go through the uh, the process on uh, on this thing here in order to uh, to make this thing actually work. And the process that I'm going to deal with here is I'm going to go and um, and sort my uh, my order ID here. I'm going to sort this in ascending order. Uh, actually, no, I'm not. That's the wrong one here. I'm going to go back to my sorted rows and delete that step. I'm going to sort my quantity in ascending order. You'll notice that we have a whole bunch of null rows that are coming here, but all of our quantities are in the correct order numerically. What I then do, just to make sure if there's any ties here, is I also sort the order ID in ascending order, and this way null will always come before the order ID. This is important to get that VLOOKUP exact match scenario that gives me the closest without going over. What happens at this point is that now my pricing rows always come before my actual data. So notice here, here's a thousand units, here's a thousand units actually spent or, or earned or, or purchased or whatever, but the pricing row is above it. This one says it has no price. So here's what we're gonna do. Right click, fill down. That fills all of the prices down, and as soon as it finds a null, it fills it, and as soon as it finds data, it says that must be the data that I need for the next one. So you can see at 955, my price was 585, at 1000, it's 575, and then if you go down another 575, we get to, um, to the, the levels that we need till we hit 565. Once we're done, we go, we uncheck this, get rid of the null, say okay, boom, there you go, VLOOKUP exact match, happening right inside Power Query. Works just fine in Power BI or Excel. And now I can even take this and go, hey, let's go add this guy here, standard. We're gonna go with a multiply. And at that point in time, I've now got my revenue at this point in time. So there we go. That's how that particular one happens. It's kind of a, a tricky little pattern in the fact that, you know, like you say there, Michael, so simple, but never would have thought of it. Uh, I'm going to admit to you, it's so simple. I never thought of it. I actually totally stole this off of my friend Oz uh, du Soleil. Um, you know, he showed me how this works. It's like, really? And that's actually the reason that I went back to the Power Query team. And I'm thinking, because I had a way to do this. I'm like, surely I can do better than my friend Oz. And, uh, you know, hat tip to Oz, like this, this is awesome. This it just worked absolutely awesome. So uh, he, uh, he taught me how to do this. And now it's a trick that I share all over the place. And there we go. It's done. Uh, if I were to go and add new things, I can hit refresh on this. Let's say I, uh, you know, let's say I added a new pricing level along the way. The big secret on this is that this one here also needs to be sorted in descending order as well. Okay. So that is your VLOOKUP approximate match inside Power Query doing a merge by doing an append. Total head scratcher, but it works beautifully. So we love that one. All right, so let me close that guy out. Um, and then uh, let me go back over to, uh, to this guy here. This is the recipe for it. Now, uh, full disclosure on this one here, um, we have a more current version of this recipe in our Power Query recipe cards uh, uh, collection, which is available at the URL you see on screen here. Uh, I actually, this is one of the very first versions of this that I wrote up, um, and we've tweaked it and, uh, and try to make these a little bit better as we go along to make sure that they're more uh, predictable for people as well. All right, one last demo I'm gonna show you with this one here. I've got the table on the top. What we can see here is we've got, we've got a boat, we've got a breakdown insurance line here, and I need to be able to extract these guys out in order to actually get information to assign it. The boat needs to be assigned to that at car line that's above it, and breakdown insurance needs to be assigned, assigned to the data that's in rows five, six, and seven. This is a tricky little pattern inside Power Query, but it actually makes use of a really cool look looking little merge technique for what we need to do. And the thing that we want to recognize about it is Right before the rows that I have highlighted in pink there with boat and breakdown insurance, we see a common pattern. We actually have something in this cell that is a dash, 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 dash. You'll also notice there's another pattern here in the row after these pink lines. It's null. Okay, so we can actually go with either the prior row or the next row, depending on which way we want to go with this one here. Now, let me show you how this, uh, this little tricky guy here works as well. So I'll open this one up. And uh, what I've got over here is I have a data set that looks like this. So 
this is uh, this is pulled into cells right here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to see whether or not I actually set my query up. It's been a while since I ran this last time. Doesn't look like I have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this raw input, pull it into Power Query, and I actually need to do a little bit of splitting on this stuff to actually get it set up correctly. Uh, this is not a table. I have defined a named range over it called data. Okay, so. Uh, that's basically just done by um, by naming it uh, through the name manager. Uh, as Joseph showed you, if you're pulling this in through Power BI, it would probably even potentially detect this as a table now, which is kind of cool. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and pull this uh, into Power Query, and then I'm going to go and clean this up. This, by the way, is um, is a sample from a real data set that somebody in the Power Query Academy actually sent me once to uh, to deal with, and uh, we asked for their permission to use it. He said, sure. So um, So here's how this is going to go. It came in originally in a text file. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to go uh, right click, split column, and I'm going to split it by number of characters. Uh, I know this because I've done this before. So I'm going to split it once as far left as possible at 31 characters. And that's going to break it so that it actually shows up right there. Okay, so we've got extra characters around this, but I'm actually breaking right before this particular line here. Uh, the next one I'm going to do here is I'm going to go right click on this guy here and I'm gonna split column uh, by number of characters. Again, we're gonna do this by eight characters repeatedly, and that's gonna break out the next little columns along the way here. I'm now gonna come along here, grab all these, right click, transform, and trim the data to get rid of all the leading and trailing spaces that are in the way on this one here. And then I'm gonna go and use first row's headers and promote that up to the top. Now, it's always the tricky part with this stuff is trying to get rid of all of the uh, all of the you know the garbage data that's in the way. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go and filter this one here with a text filter that uh, does not <clears throat> excuse me does not contain does not contain and I'm going with three dashes and I'm doing this because I want to be able to pick up this row and this row and any other rows that have any dashes in them. So we're going to get rid of those. And that's going to actually strip things down to look like this. And then I also need to go and filter out some stuff that says I do not want the rows that are source. And I don't want any rows uh, as well that start with um, the word quotations. So uh, does not begin with. I could, probably could have done some more of these inside here, but, uh, but no big deal. So quotations. There we are. Okay. So there's the relatively clean data set that I'm looking for. The problem that I'm looking at is boat, breakdown insurance, caravan. I need to get these guys. A caravan needs to be associated with all these rows, breakdown insurance with these rows, boat with these rows here. Um, now, uh, here's what I'm going to do. Um, I am going to go to solve this problem after I add a couple of very important columns. We're going to add an index column from zero, and we're going to add another index column from one. So you'll notice 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to 21, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 22. This is an integral part of making this pattern actually work. And this, I'm actually kind of bummed that Joseph left because, uh, you know, the day that, uh, that, that I, uh, I sort of, you know, told him one day when I was uh, first met him that I was going to, there's going to be this day when, when something happened in Power Query and it was going to be amazing and he should email me when it happened. And I actually got the email from him and say, wow, that's amazing. So uh, this is kind of a cool one here. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to go back to home. In order to compare to the prior row, what a lot of users will do is they will actually write a custom column that tries to use an index minus one to refer to the previous row. It is very slow and it's not a good way to do things. So here's a better way through the user interface that performs better. We go merge queries. And inside here, we're going to merge this query to itself. This is so awesome. And then what we're going to do is we're going to decide which one do we want to merge? And I'm going to match index versus index one. Notice that these things have different numbers. So they're going to come back with a match for a different row. We'll now go and say, OK. And it brings me back this added index table. Now this one, because zero, we tried to merge. There is no other uh, row that's going to work for this one. This one here is actually matching to, and I'm actually matching to the previous row. And I'm just trying to remember if this is the uh, the way that I actually wanted to go with this particular one or not, actually. Um, you know what? Regardless, I can make this one work. So here's what's going to happen. 
is I'm going to go and expand a specific column out of this data set. What I actually want to pull out is I want source and I want the quotes column. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go get rid of these. I'm going to bring out source and quotes. Um, I don't really care about the original column name here. I'm going to uncheck it because I just want to keep this a little bit shorter. And now what you'll notice is that it's actually resorted my data a little bit. Zero's at the bottom. It's very important to come back and make sure that zero is back at the top. I now have my original row here and I have some more information to work with in this particular case. What I want to do is I want to extract this wherever my quote over here is this dash, dash, dash. So at this point, it's now a simple matter of doing a conditional column to basically say, um, this is gonna be my, uh, let's call this category. Category. So we're gonna look at this and we're gonna say if quotes one equals, and I just gotta count the number of dashes in there, it looks like there's six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Then what we're going to do is we're going to pull the value or the column rather from source else we're going to put in null. And if I did this right, I should see my boat, my breakdown insurance and my caravan. I can now right click, fill up. So I now have these extracted to a new category. I'm then going to get rid of the rows that were successful in this particular case here. So I'm now going to filter to remove the row that I was actually uh, relying on in order to deal with this. We'll get rid of that. That eats my boats and caravans and stuff from over here. And now it's just a simple matter of coming back and saying, you know what? Don't need these anymore. What have you done for me lately? We can get rid of all the blank rows in this particular case here. And at that point, Boom, there we go. There's our nice clean data set. I might want to break up, you know, one more column along the way or something like that. But this is a really cool little technique. And, uh, you know, it's funny. Whenever I teach about merging things um, and we're, we're looking at brand new tables, I always tell people with this one, you know, like it seems so weird when there is this, this thing that you can actually merge a table to itself. But one day you will find the need. And when you do, it's going to be like, oh, man, this changed my life. I love this pattern. I think it's so cool because who would have ever thought that you would actually merge to yourself? Like it just, you know, it's, it's bizarre. And yet it works really well for comparing to the prior row like that. Um, if there's a pattern that you can actually exploit. So add your index from zero, add your index from one. And at that point in time, you can now compare to the prior row. If you want to get a little bit more tricky with it, of course, you could actually go and do a little bit more work on that. Maybe using, you know, some modulos or some integer divides to, you know, compare to four rows up or five rows up. I won't show you any of that kind of stuff, but it is possible to compare to previous or next rows uh, along the way when you're, uh, when you're dealing with those things. So so there you go, just kind of another uh, another neat little technique that uh, that you can keep in the toolbox. Uh, so that is the you know the sort of the more full blown recipe for this. And as I say, you can very quickly convert it from prior row to next row by simply switching which columns do you merge. Do you merge from index to index one, or do you merge from index one to index? And then uh, that actually changes up the uh, the pattern there. This pattern also has been tweaked, uh, I believe, in the in the recipe card versions. Um, I can see that I released the the latest update for this one in um, in October 2019, so about a year ago. But it's definitely newer than what you're seeing on screen here. This this presentation. Um, all right, I am uh, I'm pretty much at the end here, but I do want to uh, to throw out uh, on this one here um, all the material that you see here, all these recipe cards. Um, are actually part of our Power Query recipes. They work for Excel and Power BI. If you're interested in picking up more of them, you can actually pick that up at uh, at our um, at our skillwave.training website. Uh, there are over 50 different Power Query recipe cards in this package, and I add more on a uh, on a semi-regular basis along the way. Um, if you're interested, you can actually pick these ones up as just buying like the actual package of what's there, or you can actually do uh, an, a subscription at a very low quarterly price. Uh, it's only like $2.95 per quarter to keep the subscription active. Um, and then you'll actually get the updates as we release them with uh, with new ones when I add new recipes and uh, and go and add new new um, or add new recipes or tweak them when I find out that something didn't work the way I wanted. Uh, if you really want to master your data um, and even learn things that apparently I don't know from uh, from what's going on, the Power Query Academy has a bunch of uh, really cool stuff in there. Uh, this is the most advanced, uh, well, from beginner to the most advanced Power Query uh, material that you will actually find 
uh, on the planet today. Uh, myself, Miguel Escobar, and Matt Allington have all got videos on this thing, um, and we're, we're super, super proud of it. Uh, so, you know, I'd highly recommend for your power query training that you check this out. And if you're interested in learning more about dimensional modeling, we've got a course on that as well, uh, among other things. Uh, one of the things that I would really like to encourage you all to do is actually sign up for our newsletter. Uh, you do get a free ebook here and, uh, you know, a, a newsletter with monthly roundup of blog posts from the authors and other things. But one of the big things that you also get is you get information on the available courses that we do, upcoming events, and promotions. And we're getting really close to Black Friday. I'm just saying you might want to have your name on our list. So maybe consider that if you like the stuff that we do here. Outside of that, I'm going to close this one off for the day. Um, I, uh, I I really appreciate the comments that have been coming in on this stuff here, and um, you know it, it's awesome to see that some of you guys actually have uh, used some of these techniques and uh, and you like these guys here. So um, fantastic! Uh, thank you for coming on this kind of stuff or for for this uh, this meetup here. Um, I am going to uh, to go and just uh, uh, stop the recording on this one, but I do promise on this that I will get this up in the next couple of days uh, onto our uh, onto the uh, meetup site. Uh, we'll post a link once it's there, and it'll be up on uh, on YouTube. So, uh, thanks all for coming. Uh, it was a great turnout today. Thanks for your comments coming through, and um, I will uh, I will be in touch. And yes, I will actually go and share the uh, the PowerPoint slides for this thing. Although, uh, just as I say, there are um, more current versions in the recipe card deck as well. So thanks again for coming, folks. Have a safe one. Uh, don't forget to register for the next meetups. Uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks with John's, hopefully.